Tune in for this week's episode with Tanya DeYoung, a trailblazing Australian soprano global speaker and award-winning social entrepreneur who started Mind Medicine Australia, supporting psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy for the treatment of mental illness in Australia. Welcome to the Third Wave Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Austin, here to bring you cutting-edge interviews with leading scientists, entrepreneurs, and medical professionals who are exploring how we can integrate psychedelics in an intentional and responsible way for both healing and transformation. It is my honor and privilege to bring you these episodes as you get deeper and deeper into why these medicines are so critical to the future of humanity. So let's go and let's see what we can explore and learn together in this incredibly important time. Hey, listeners, and welcome back to the Third Wave podcast. You know, it's not very often that I have a chance to interview someone from down under. I think the only other podcast interview we've done with someone from Australia was with Stephen Bright, who is a co-founder of PRISM and a psychedelic researcher, and that was probably back in 2016. So it's been almost four years now since we've had a chance, and You know, during the COVID era, I think this was in April, I had been pinging back and forth with Tanya DeYoung, who had started Mind Medicine Australia, a nonprofit charity to support regulatory approved and research backed psychedelic assisted therapy in Australia. And Tanya's background, I mean, the work with Mind Medicine is great, but we've heard a lot about that on the podcast in terms of the efficacy of psychedelics for depression and addiction and things like this. But Tanya's personal story about how she came into psychedelics, who she was before, what shifted as a result of that experience, and now why she is dedicating so much of her time and energy. And this woman has a lot of energy, why she's dedicating it to this important initiative. We really get deep into that in this podcast. A few things that we talk about are Syrian rue, psilocybin, out-of-body experiences, and letting go of ego, how psychedelics help us to overcome intergenerational and collective trauma, uh, the slow and steady journey towards legalizing psychedelics, not something I'm always a fan of, but I think it's important that we put one step and one foot in front of the other. You know, Tanya is basically overachiever status. She started this charity while simultaneously attending law school and opera school and coaching tennis to earn money. How did she manage all of this? And then probably the most fascinating thing that we dug into is because of Tanya's background as a soprano singer, uh, how singing is very similar to psychedelic experiences and how it can also connect neural pathways, release endorphins, increase neuroplasticity, and allow us to feel the experience of oneness. If you're interested in what's going on in Australia with psychedelics, And more importantly, if you just want to hear the story of an incredible woman and why she's so motivated to help medicalize psychedelics through My Medicine Australia, then I encourage you to tune in to this week's episode. So without any further ado, I bring you Tanya DeYoung. What inspired Mind Medicine for you and that the beginning of that journey? Yeah, Mind Medicine Australia. Wow, that was something that was an unplanned pregnancy. (laughs) (laughs) no so what actually happened was so my husband's peter hunt and he's an ex-investment banker and both of us have started multiple charities so between us before mind medicine australia he'd started two charities which were focused on women's homelessness and he's also the chair of a number of other charities in the homelessness social you know microfinance space relieving poverty in africa all sorts of different charities that he's been heavily involved with And I've set up two previous charities to this one. One of them is the Song Room, which I set up 20 years ago, which provides music and arts education to disadvantaged schools and children. And the second one is called Creativity Australia and the With One Voice program. And that focuses on bridging the the gap between haves and have-nots, fortunate and less fortunate people through social inclusion choirs. And... um, So really, you know, we were really busy with with our charities. Plus, of course, I perform and speak and have been running this global conference on innovation and the pace of change and the speed of acceleration of technology and the the major wicked challenges we're facing with that. Then one day, I mean, I, I, I read Tim Ferriss's blogs and this one particular day, there was a link to a Michael Pollan 
article and the article was in the New Yorker called The Trip Treatment. It was back like four years ago, I guess now. And um, I read this article and for some reason it just really resonated with me. And so I said to Peter, you know, you must have a look at this article and read this article. And he read the article and um, I said, look, I really think we should do this therapy. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. so Peter and I have never had any drugs of any kind whatsoever. I actually don't even drink alcohol. I don't drink coffee. Like I'm a really boring Mm -hmm. person. (laughs) (laughs) And um, You pick your spots. You pick your spots. Yeah, I pick my spots. That's right. And I get high from singing. You know, I'm a singer and, Mm -hmm. you know, get an incredible – sense of connection and, and a raised consciousness through through my art, really. But no, you know, what happened was I um, I reached out to Robin Carhart Harris because he was mentioned in the article and I said, could we join a trial? Because we thought, well, if we're going to do this, then we really need to do this in a really safe place and, you know, we need to do it in a hospital. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. um, so there was no trials going on for, you know, um, patients that didn't have a particular mental health condition of healthy volunteers, I guess. And so eventually they referred us to the Psychedelic Society in the UK and they didn't have any retreats that coincided with when we were going to be in Europe. So they then referred us to a private guide in the Netherlands and we flew there and we had a session with this guide in the Netherlands, which was a, you know, a significant... In Amsterdam? Uh, in no, Amsterdam? It, was out of Amster- it was out of Amsterdam, it was okay. in there. The okay. country sort of area. And I, I'm Dutch actually by background, so, mm. you know, it's like going home in a way. Going Well, it was like mm. going home in many ways. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, no, so we had this session with, with this guide and actually it was a really interesting session because it was Peganum seeds or Syrian rue. It started with Syrian rue. Interesting. Um, an hour before the, the psilocybin. And of course How did that goat, feel? Uh, the Syrian rue is very calming. So, you know, I think okay. it's a, a very calming substance. And, of course, Syrian rue is legal, you know, in most places, I think. And it just calmed us down, you know, put us into a meditative state. And then we had a large dose of psilocybin. I don't really know how large the dose was, like, but it was large. That really, you know, catapulted us into the cosmos, into this multidimensional realm, you know, that all your listeners probably are very familiar with and took us into way more than five dimensions, I'd say. (laughs) You know, we'd never had an out-of-body experience before and this is like quite a, yeah, I mean it was actually quite difficult to to let go and go into that space. You know, I think both of us were fighting against it to begin with but the dose was was high. So, (laughs) But I remember that, you know, my final sort of letting go was, that I saw these three square boxes um, that had the word ego written in them mm-hmm. and they had these red crosses in them and I just kept saying, you know, bloody ego, just, you know, I was swearing actually, but I won't do it. <laughs> but, you know, I was just going, just get the hell out of here, you know, just get the hell out of here, you know, bloody ego, get the hell out of here, you know. And I just kept, and there was there was these um, drains, these gutters underneath the boxes, and I kept pushing my ego down into the drain, literally, <laughs> and and just trying to just like get it down the drain. And finally, when that, when I did that enough, um, I just went like on this, yeah, this incredible sort of journey that took me through lifetimes. And you know, I um, I'm the daughter of and granddaughter of Holocaust survivors, so you know, I. Mm-hmm. I saw a lot of that. My husband's father committed suicide when he was 13 and we all carry um, trauma with us. If we haven't had in our own lives, then we're carrying intergenerational trauma anyway from our parents and grandparents. And we're also carrying this sort of collective trauma that we're all experiencing. And of course, we're all experiencing that now with this pandemic as well. So we're all um, carrying this trauma and it was really um, an incredible experience to go through all of, I suppose, that, but also to see what I can only imagine were previous lives that my soul has experienced as well, because things I've never seen before. And then just coming out of it, it was, you know, like everyone says, you know, the most incredible experience in our lives, um, this incredible sense of connection and awareness of, you know, how every 
everything in life is sacred and everything that is alive is sacred and that, you know, we are part of everything and everything is part of us. And this incredible sense of gratitude that came out of the experience and this enormous love and profound and eternal light that we experienced. And this was so profound that we actually didn't have another ceremony for another year after that. So Mm. we read a lot of articles, watched a lot of videos, became incredibly interested in the field. And then a year later, we, we had another ceremony with the same guide in the Netherlands. This was an even stronger dose and, um, you know, had even more profound effects. And we really came out of that and we said, well, if this is having this much impact on us, and it was really healing for us, not only like as individuals, but for our relationship with one another, because it was, I think, um, that was, you know, after that ceremony, I think my husband asked me to, to marry him and, um, mm. you know, and, oh, you know, the, oh, wow, that's, yeah. that's huge. Yeah. And then, you know, you know, the impact it had in our relationships with our families, with others in our workplaces, just the impact it had on our creativity and our energy and vitality and an overall health and well-being was really very profound. And we thought, well, if this is having this much impact on us, these medicines have got to be available to people who are really suffering. And Mm -hmm. there's not a single experience that I've had with psychedelics ever since then where we haven't both said to one another, we have to make sure these medicines become available to everyone who needs them in a medically controlled environment because there are just so many people suffering. I mean, as you have in the US, I mean, we have a, a massive mental health crisis and this was already massive well before the COVID crisis. I mean, we just had a bushfire crisis in Australia recently and right. over the, over our summer. But even before that, you know, one in five Australians with a mental illness an estimated one in two of us having a serious mental illness in our lifetimes. One in eight Australians are on antidepressants. One in four older adults are on antidepressants. And about, you know, an average of eight people in Australia, and bear in mind, you know, we're not a huge population, are committing suicide every day. You know, it's an absolute human tragedy. The amount of suffering, the heartbreak is really enormous. And so, yeah, I mean, there's not a day that goes by with Mind Medicine Australia where we don't receive numerous letters from people imploring us to, you know, provide people with a pathway to access the medicines and the treatments with the most heartbreaking stories. With psychedelics, you know, that was one thing that I came to some level of awareness to is for a lot of people, these are, for many people, in fact, they're a last resort or last option. It's really heartbreaking to read those letters and, and, you know, we do all we can to point people, you know, to legal avenues overseas. But, you know, the best thing that we can do and so what we set about doing was once, you know, we said, well, we've got to make sure these become available to everyone was we started to connect with all the leading researchers and psychiatrists globally and we started to attend various events, for example, um, you know, the Beyond Psychedelics in Prague, which which I spoke at. Mm-hmm. But even then we hadn't decided to set up a charity. Like it really was not until um, 2018 that we decided to set up Mind Medicine Australia. And I think really that was inspired through partly through a conversation, that, you know, that I had with Rick Doblin and um, mm-hmm. who, I, you know, who I'd met before and we'd been talking. And But, you know, it was just suddenly came to us that we should set up a charity because, you know, we could have continued to potentially just give money and, and so on, but there was really no professional organization in Australia or indeed the Asia Pacific region at all. So, you know, there's Mm. psychedelic societies and, you know, a couple of organizations who are doing some research and things like that, but there was not a coordinated approach to making these medicines accessible and available as medical treatments in this region, not at all. And so we set about setting up Mind Medicine Australia um, to really build an ecosystem in this region to make the medicines available. And so our organisation has four key strategic initiatives, four key strategic pillars, I guess. And it's important to, to just 
say to listeners out there, like we only launched this in February 2019. So we've only been going for just over a year at the time of this interview. In that year, we've set up a number of things. So one of them is our education and awareness pillar. So basically what we do is we run a whole stack of education events um, ranging from, you know, information sessions across different sectors, not just the health sector, but um, other sectors, business sector, government sector, the general public, of course. We run regular screenings of relevant documentaries. We've set up chapters in many states of Australia, both in capital cities, and we're also setting up regional chapters and looking to do that in in other countries in the region as well. We also have a major global summit planned for November, which we're praying will go ahead in November. And um, we have a number of the leading, you know, scientists and researchers and psychiatrists and doctors in this space coming to Melbourne for that. And it's an international summit on psychedelic therapies for mental illness. We already have sold over 300 tickets for that. And probably if it were not for this pandemic, we would have sold out by now, actually. The amount of interest is is enormous. The second part of our pillar is to make sure that there's a pipeline of therapists and clinicians who are ready and willing and able to work with these medicines. And so we're setting up a certificate in psychedelic therapies that's commencing in early 2021. And we've brought a leading clinical psychologist who's worked at Imperial College with the psilocybin trials to Australia to work with us and design and develop, you know, the best practice professional development program we can create, which will be a mix of face-to-face and in-person over four months. So we'll have a couple of intakes for that certificate in 2021. We're also working with other leaders in the field like Janice Phelps and and others on that program. So that's very exciting and and, uh, actually registrations for that will open in June. Also actually as part of the whole awareness and education first pillar, obviously, we've built an amazing board and advisory panel and, and team of ambassadors. So you'll see that on our website we have uh, our four key ambassadors, which are Rick Doblin, David Nutt, Roland Griffiths and Ben Sesser. And then we have an advisory panel. So we have people across all sectors really who are helping to make sure that these medicines are well understood to help reduce the stigma and, and just to really improve the credibility um, around this movement. What's the current perspective, you know, what's the current um, feeling in Australia? You know, in the United States, I would say uh, on the bi-coastal LA, New York, San Francisco, Portland, places like Austin, they're becoming fairly well accepted. What's sort of the the general understanding of it in Australia at this point in time? Um, so that goes back to our first pillar, and I'll finish off the other two pillars in a sec for you. But the awareness is certainly increasing. Like one of the things that we did early on was we supported a trial which is taking place with PRISM at um, St. Vincent's Hospital, and that's in end-of-life depression and anxiety for people with a terminal diagnosis. By supporting that, that really got Australia onto the global map, I guess, in terms of this movement because the media really started to take notice of these medicines. So it was a really important thing to do was to get that first trial happening in Australia. And that raised awareness not only in the media and, of course, people who were reading that, content, but people started to, you know, look at other content. And certainly once we launched Mind Medicine Australia just over a year ago, I mean, it's just incredible how much interest we've we've had, not just from people reaching out, obviously, for the medicines, which we can't provide, but from philanthropists wanting to support the work, from other people wanting to partner with us, from people wanting to volunteer, but also from the medical profession itself, you know, from GPs and psychologists and psychotherapists and psychiatrists in particular, all of whom recognise the desperation of the mental health crisis that we're experiencing and all of whom don't have enough tools in their toolbox to treat people who are who are ill. And we literally have psychiatrists and others saying to us, well, out of 20 people coming in to work with me after two years, Perhaps I can only get one person through the system. The other 19 
are still in the system. You know, I still have to see them because they're not better. So that means they can't take on new patients either, which means that all the people who are experiencing mental illness can't get in, you know, with fantastic practitioners. So a big part of our work is is really getting medical practitioners up the curve. So we have some of our psychiatrists um, speak at really major GP forums and um, other medical forums, and it's just all about explaining to people the science and showing them the evidence in the trials. Because, you know, as we all know who are in this space, the evidence is so compelling from these current and recent trials. And once you start showing that to people and you show the effect sizes and you show how superior these medicines are compared to current existing treatments, that there's, you know, there's been no innovation for nearly 50 years, as we all know, in current treatments for depression, anxiety, and a whole host of other conditions. So once people start to realise the remissions that are occurring uh, through these trials, they become very interested because all of us want to help people, you know, to, to get better. So our goal is just to help people get better, pure and simple. Little by little, you know, country town by country town, I say, doctor by doctor, psychologist by psychologist, we're just trying to educate people about these medicines and um, get people up the curve and remove any stigma that there is and, and help people to understand that these medicines are profound mind-altering medicines and that the effects, you know, when they're used in properly intentioned environments are long-lasting and will simply transform the way that people view themselves in the world. The third part of our strategic pillars is a centre of excellence in psychedelic medicine. The difference, I guess, between the centre that we're proposing and the ones that are set up so far is that this centre will have applied research and development, which um, the other centres have, but also we're looking at the manufacturing of medicines, um, rollout of clinics, much more education of medical students and other allied health practitioners. Obviously, you know, in common with other centres of excellence, we're also looking at novel trials. So looking at other conditions that haven't been, you know, significantly researched yet. And we're also looking at the whole ethical framework for these medicines and, you know, how they can best be part of the medical system so that doctors, when they have a patient come in, they don't just provide an option of, you know, antidepressants or psychotherapy, but they can actually say, well, actually, there's another option, which is psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. And these are the benefits and these are the drawbacks. So that Patients are fully informed of what the different options are and, you know, side effects for all. You know, when it comes to the the timeline for when these medicines will be accepted, how have you sort of charted that out from a strategic perspective? What sort of like, you know, we know in the United States, mm. you know, MAP says MDMA will be available for PTSD by supposedly 2022. There's currently ketamine treatments going on in mm -hmm. both, you know, integrative clinics, which are less popular, more popular are sort of you know, these clinics where you just get injected with an IV and you sit in a chair and, you know, you have it that way. You know, I also in 2018 started a retreat center called Synthesis in yes. the Netherlands. Yeah. And so that, you know, that that's another legal option. So there's yeah. more and more innovation popping up in places like Europe and the States, but yes. still in Australia, it feels like, you know, Australia is a, <laughs> a few years behind. What's that sort of like schedule like? Well, we're not behind anymore. You know, that's great to hear. There's a real acceleration taking place, which obviously we're driving through Mind Medicine Australia. We have spoken to the regulators. We are certainly looking at the SAS type scheme, which is a special access scheme, which also exists in the US and Switzerland and Israel, which is like a compassionate use scheme where, you know, a psychiatrist has run out of options for a patient and they're in danger that the doctor, the psychiatrist can uh, apply to the regulator on a case-by-case -case basis or as an authorised prescriber for the use of the medicine, obviously in a medically controlled environment. That's the only thing really that we're focused on is medically controlled environments. I'm not saying that we're against recreational use or anything like that, but Mind Medicine Australia is focused on medical environments. Yeah, we're working with the regulator. We're in dialogue with the regulators. The regulators have indicated that they will also take note of the trials in the US. For example, the, the phase three trials, obviously, that 
um, MAPS is undertaking at the moment and we'll look at all trials going on overseas in terms of the regulatory path. And traditionally, Australia does follow the USA and Europe in everything. I mean, unfortunately, Australia followed the US when Nixon prohibited the medicines back in 1970 as well, which is why we're in the position we're in now, right? Australia will follow what is going on elsewhere. And in the interim, there's obviously a lot of education to be done. The special access scheme is is a pathway as well. And and there's other researchers in Australia who are commencing small trials in a a whole range of universities and, and so on as well. So yeah, we're starting to steam forwards here in Australia. You know, we've seen, for example, a lot of venture capital in, in the, the United mm-hmm. States in the psychedelic space. So there's a company, MindMed, that has raised yeah. millions. There's Her name was first, by the way. <laughs> Who was? Well, MindMed. Oh, your, your name was first. Your name was first. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> good. Good, good. In Canada, there's a ton of money coming in, in, in yeah. the UK, et cetera, et cetera. That's right. What's the status of that in Australia? Have there started to be companies that are starting yeah. to anticipate, you know, the medical market that are, you know, not yeah. charities or you know, that are for profit? There are investors around. We direct some of those to to mine men, you know, to some of the other companies that are um, doing stuff overseas, like Eleusis and some of those as well. But we anticipate there being, and again, this is part of building the ecosystem. We're not wanting or needing to make profit out of this, but we believe there will be opportunities for the right investors to invest in this space, to create an ecosystem in this region. That hasn't happened with cannabis yet, right? Like cannabis isn't legal or medical or anything in Australia. Uh, we, again, it is through the special access scheme. So okay. w- what started out as a very slow and cumbersome regulatory, or not regulatory, but special access scheme, you know, there was it was really hard to get approvals for medicinal cannabis. And Look, it's still not that easy, but there's about 4,000 approvals going through a month, which is significant, right? So there are certainly people investing in the cannabis space and there's numerous, not only cannabis companies in Australia, but cannabis peak bodies and cannabis conferences and all sorts of stuff happening in the cannabis space in Australia. Let's talk a little bit more about, you know, what you did before all of this. I think that's that's extremely relevant to, to your story mm-hmm. in terms of you've, you've started a charity, of, charity before, you've had several businesses, right? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. I'd just be curious to hear from your perspective how, you know, everything you've done professionally up until this point in time, how has that prepared you to take on something as, I would say, important as this initiative, you know, something that has a lot of responsibility, something that has a lot of scrutiny, something that has, you know, a lot of rigorous things that need to be met. They are not without the risks. They're incredibly misunderstood. You know, I I know having been in this space now for four years, I was sort of people who didn't get psychedelics thought I was crazy. And then people who were doing psychedelics because I was an entrepreneur thought I was crazy. Yeah, that's right. I can win. You know, so it's sort of like these are still very new. How is sort of, you know, you've blazed an incredible trail before this. I'd love to hear you talk about more how that's led into this. Yeah, no, well, it certainly has. I mean, I feel like all roads have led to this. And I've always been the sort of person that takes the the road less traveled. You know, that beautiful poem, The Road Less Traveled. And um, I guess... Is that Robert Frost? Yeah, Robert Frost's poem is stunning. And actually, I might send you, um, like, you know, a song or something, some one of my original pieces to put with this podcast, thinking about it, because that would be lovely. actually at the end of a lot of my ceremonies, I come up with lyrics for songs and, and create songs that come out of um, out of this. But so what happened really, just to, to give listeners a, a short praise, is, you know, I've always wanted to sing when I was 14, I wanted to have singing lessons, but my best girlfriend told me not to bother and said I wasn't good enough. And this is all in my TED Talk, How Singing Together Changes the Brain, which has been viewed, I think, about 100,000 times now. So basically, I didn't sing at that stage. I did backstage in the school musical, and I was also a very good sports person. I was a very good tennis player, and my mum was actually a Wimbledon quarterfinalist. And so I ended up auditioning for the chorus of the school musical in year 11. I thought at least I can get in the chorus. And to my amazement, I got the lead role in Oklahoma. You know, Oklahoma. Yeah, the, the wonderful musical. And Sing it. Uh, Oklahoma. I love it. And I played the lead role in Oklahoma in year 11. And that was like, wow, this is what I have to be doing with my life. I was also a very good tennis player myself. And so I applied 
to do a tennis scholarship in the US and I got a scholarship to go to a college in Waco, Texas, of all places. Which college? Was this it Baylor? It was McLennan College. It was, um, it was near oh, Baylor cool. College, which is in Texas as well. And so I went over there and when I was 18 and I spent quite a bit of time in Texas and, and all around the US actually playing tennis and I also learned to coach tennis and I was still singing, you know, obviously I've, I've been singing all the time and I, I sing all over the world now and I've released many, many CDs. But tennis was a big, a big passion of mine at the time as well. And so I was playing tennis and then I learned to be a tennis coach and long story short, I came back to Australia. But I decided that I'd got into a music degree, but I decided that I actually, for whatever reason, that that was not going to be secure enough and I enrolled in law. So that was actually really good training for me. It gave me an enormous foundation for everything I've done with the rest of my career. So I did law. At the same time as doing law, I was at opera school and I was coaching tennis to earn money. So I had this um, really diverse time at university where I was doing all these different things and juggling a lot of different balls. It was at that time that I started my group, Potpourri, which is a singing group and which has subsequently toured in over 40 countries around the world and released seven albums. And literally we were playing like 130 gigs each year around the world and I was at opera school and finishing my law degree and all of this was going on simultaneously. And um, then I set up my first charity, which is called The Song Room, 20 years ago, which has brought music and arts to disadvantaged children, like I mentioned earlier, and has reached, I think, probably nearly a million children around Australia now with its programs. And it helps improve the learning skills and well-being and self-esteem of children through music and the arts. And then In addition to that, 11 years ago, I set up Creativity Australia, which brings social inclusion choirs uh, to, I think, nearly 30 communities around Australia now. And there's been With One Voice choirs set up also in, in overseas countries as well. So we've created a social franchise model, which enables community leaders to replicate the With One Voice model and set up programs around the world. So that's a really powerful program which changes and saves lives every day. And really, I guess it's it's a front runner to, to Mind Medicine Australia because it is also focused on alleviating mental illness, social isolation and loneliness because singing is actually a mind-altering drug of its own. And in my TED Talk, people can see why singing, particularly with others, it's like a super wonder drug, I call it. And um It also helps take people into an altered state and helps connect up neural pathways similarly to the psychedelic medicines. So when you sing with other people, you know, it makes you smarter, healthier, happier, more creative. You know, you release, you know, a whole lot of endorphins and your right temporal lobe of your brain wakes up making you, you know, increase your neuroplasticity, improve your memory, language and concentration and so on. So it really is quite... We We could do an entire podcast just on that. Absolutely. I mean, on, it is on, really on fascinating. You know, I, I, I just to tell a little bit to mirror this. You know, I grew up in a church. Oh, uh, one in, in West Michigan. I'm Dutch as well. I went to oh. I went to a school called Hope College in Holland, Michigan. There's a tulip festival there every year. I'm like, super oh, beautiful. Dumb. So I grew up in a church, and so you know, my, the only part I enjoyed about sitting in services because a lot of it was quite dry. But the part that I mostly enjoyed was, you know, every so often we would get up and we would sing hymns, and it was like an old church, and there was a beautiful organ, and it was like a, incredible acoustics. Mm. And I always, you know, that was the time where I felt connected. Yeah. And so, you know, as you're talking about this, it t- makes total sense that. Like in churches, singing is such a central part of yes. that community and that connection. A lot of people liken the With One Voice programs to, you know, going to church, but without the whole religious dogma. So the people come to our choirs. It's a weekly home and haven for many people. And we bring together people like, you know, doctors, lawyers, teachers, retirees and others, but with people who are migrants, job seekers, people with disability and depression in these choirs and we're all there together and what happens is the barriers between us fade away there is no more us and them it's just us you know and 
we're all just we're a group. One. Yeah, yeah, we're all brothers and sisters singing together no matter what our age, our background, our faith, whatever. And the beautiful thing of the program is that not only does it take people into this incredible state, you know, where they where they feel that their brain is buzzing and they're, you know, more connected and so on, but it empowers people to ask for what they need in life. So we have a wish list program that's attached to the With One Voice program where at every choir every week, people can make wishes for what they need in life. And that is for both the fortunate and less fortunate people in the choirs. Everyone can wish for what they need. And so a wish list volunteer gets up each week, they read the wishes, and literally people start putting up their hands and start granting one another's wishes, which could be anything from, you know, help with the resume, learning English, learning how to use the internet, getting a job, even finding a partner. I mean, we've had numerous marriages <laughs> that have occurred there you through go. the choirs. And we're that's, not a that's what the community is great for. Yeah, that's right. I started through the psychedelics to really investigate my own story, which is, you know, this story, this tragic story of the Holocaust, which mm. basically wiped out my grandparents and my parents, just pretty much the majority of all our relatives. It's really by the sheer grace of God, whatever you call it, <laughs> a greater being that I'm here at all today. So, so all of this has come up for me. And in seeing this journey and seeing literally these scenes from the Holocaust and so on in my experiences, which have been horrific, I feel like this incredible sense of gratitude for being here. I've also learned that I have to, you know, accept this and, you know, we all have to move on from these traumas. You know, that doesn't mean that the perpetrators didn't do terrible things. I'm not at all saying that. that. And we always have to remember what has happened, but we can move forwards. I just felt that I've been given this gift. I've been given this gift of being here on this planet and you'll hear like one of the songs I'll give you will be this song, uh, Flying Free, which mm. I wrote at the top of Machu Picchu. Mm. And it really is, you know, saying, well, thank you, you know, for being on this earth. What a blessing it is to be in this, you know, incarnation, to be alive on this planet with all the beauty that's here, despite all the, you know, the awful cruelties that human beings do to one another and to nature and to animals and everything. It's still a beautiful it still is a beautiful universe, right? And in that suffering, you know, that suffering is what comes out of that is is life and beauty yeah. and sort of like the the resilience. You know, Viktor Frankl wrote about this in, yeah. well, in Man's right. Search for Meaning. It's that existential moment where we, where when we when we're really blessed with life, we we can mm. affirm it in a beautiful way. The greatest gift, and my parents have taught me, is around resilience, you know, that you fall over, you get knocked over, but you bounce back up again. My grandmother was an incredible woman. She invented the very first foldable umbrella in Vienna in 1929. We should be like multi-billionaires now, but of course that umbrella was manufactured for 10 years until 1939 in Vienna. And then of course she was forced to sell her patent to the, mm. to the Germans and she was never to see another cent from her invention. But she still is noted as the holder of the umbrella, foldable umbrella in, you know, all the, the patent offices around the world. The thing about it is she taught me two really important things. One of them was the importance of curiosity. And also she taught me about failure. And I always see the word fail as first attempt in learning so that, yeah, you just keep trying and trying again, failing fast. And you can see her working notes that she says, I tried this today, didn't work, but tomorrow I'm going to try this. And eventually, you know, this went on for many months as she was inventing her foldable umbrella. And it's documented in my mum's book, Driftwood, which has become a, you know, a wonderful selling book on this story. I feel that all of this, and plus, you know, setting up six creative businesses, I've set up a a global conference called Creative Innovation Global over the last 10 years where I've brought um, really the leading thinkers and leaders in the world to Australia who, who are focused on the, the pace of acceleration and change across a variety of sectors, ranging from people like Ray Kurzweil and Peter Diamandis and people like Daniel Dennett and all sorts of other incredible people to Australia over the, the last 10 years. 
Peter Diamandis, I, I met him in a thing yeah. about mm, 10 months ago, and he's really yeah. interested in psychedelics and now has been talking right. about his own psychedelic use on a, on a few podcasts. I don't know specifically about Daniel Dennett, but uh, you know, Dennett's work on, on neuroscience and the level of detail that he takes in terms of understanding the human mind is, is fascinating. It is. I'm curious, how does that parlay into what you're looking to do with the, the conference in November? You know, like yeah. how are you looking at it from an innovative perspective to really ensure that it's a, yeah. a, a really shifting conference in the, in the conversation? Over these last few years, particularly the last couple of creative innovation summits, was that they, to all intents and purposes, they look like conferences where we're upskilling people and fast tracking their knowledge about the future through understanding exponential technologies and through understanding the pace of change and, and how to manage and prepare for rapid disruption and change. That's what those summits have been about. In the first few years, I guess, they have always included multiple art forms in them. So they've always been multimedia extravaganzas that, you know, include music and visual projections and, you know, graphic recorders and artists and others in them. And so they've been like out of the box conferences. I mean, we've actually won major global awards for these conferences on multiple occasions for their innovation because the conference format itself is very innovative. But once I came across the psychedelics, I can let you into a secret now is that I started to use some of the best psychedelic videos and, and I created music. And so that all these corporates would be sitting in the room like hundreds of people and they'd be seeing these videos in between sessions and you know to emphasize certain sessions and so on so the people are actually already starting to experience so you were incepting them <laughs> yeah that was basically. experiencing older states <laughs> you know we were putting people into slightly older states in the actual summit so we'd get them all singing we'd get them all dancing together we'd put on videos that were taking them into different realms. So we were already raising people's consciousness through these summits a few years ago. It's a focus on the science and medicine, this summit. That's really where the focus is. But we will certainly ensure that people who are sitting there, because we want to have a mix of people at the summit ranging from, you know, government officials and business leaders and investors and philanthropists, obviously through to all the medical practitioners, that everyone who's there hopefully will connect. And that's one of the things that we really focus on is what I call positive human collisions and really getting people from different sectors to connect and start to see one another's point of view. So that actually we all become one. We are all one. So we might as well help people to experience this movement and align together and see that we're more alike than we are different. Even if we hold different mindsets and, and different views, Every view can be respected. Well, with, you know, MAPS did this conference three years ago, the Psychedelic Science Conference. It was at yeah. a hotel in Oakland. And, you know, they, in terms of how you're just talking about this conference, that's the mm. closest parallel that comes up because it was an overall focus on the science and the yeah. researchers, but they also integrated other arts and elements and they had yeah. a, you know, a place where you could, you could buy certain things to support, you know, some of the organizations were there and people were outside hanging out. And mm. it, w it was very much like, this is science and this is, this is serious and this is professional. Mm. And we're here to enjoy ourselves and connect with others. And I think when we look at doing specifically conferences in the psychedelic space, that's so critical because these experiences themselves are not intellectual experiences. As no, we all, as and, we all know. you know, these medicines and, and what we're talking about here is really you know, I think we all understand this on this podcast, but, you know, it's not a 2D or 3D experience. It's like it's a multidimensional experience. And you can talk about the science, but you actually have to experience what's going on. And so if you can't have the medicine, well, then you have to take people into other altered states, you know, either, either using virtual reality or, you know, other types of visual and artistic ways of taking people into those states so that they can actually experience an altered state in some way. Everyone can't be doing mushrooms yet. The right. right. That's just you know, not, well, we're not going to be providing not, substances not at the conference. Let me be real. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> well, <don't laughs> so. well, there'll be coffee and stuff. <laughs> coffee and teas and, and, and you know, things and like that. Superfoods. Right. Have some superfoods. Right. right. Mm -hmm. Superfoods are great. 
Superfoods are great. I love, I love superfoods. <laughs> We've gone so deep into, you know, mind medicine as a company and your strategic pillars. And, you know, we've heard a lot about your story and how that interweaves into oh, the, the really innovative approach that you're taking. These plant medicines is part of, I believe, our human birthright. And if we want to heal this planet and we want to heal all the people who are suffering in it, then these medicines need to become available as soon as possible. Totally. 100%. That's a great way to end it. Before we leave, though, if you could just give our listeners like, you know, more details. So where, where can they find out more yeah. information about the conference yeah. And, yeah. and all that good stuff? So anyone who's um, interested in connecting, please reach out. We really love hearing from you. And um, it's www.mindmedicineaustralia.org. We are a registered charity. We accept donations, which are fully tax deductible. The summit is 16th to 19th November. There's a two-day introductory workshop on psychedelic therapies for therapists and other interested people. Then there's a two-day summit. Please register soon because it will sell out. Connect with us. Reach out. Don't be a stranger. Let us know how we can help you as well. And, you know, together we can change the world. I love it. Well, thank you so much, Tanya. It's been an honor to have you on the podcast. No, thank you. And thanks for having me. I really um, salute what you're doing and uh, look forward to keeping the dialogue going. Thanks.